we have a new memory verse, so before junior church is dismissed, we're going to say this verse. So a brand new verse moving into chapter 5 of Ephesians. Say it with me. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Ephesians 5.1. If Joshua was here, I'd ask him if he's got it already. He's, he's pretty quick on the draw, but yeah, pretty easy one. You can be dismissed for junior church, yep. Be imitators of God as dear children. All right. Then I invite you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, please. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to look at this verse in a little detail and look at some ramifications having to do with this, this idea. And as we, you know, one of the key, key words there is the idea of imitate. And uh, you know what? Kids imitate parents all the time. And uh, I asked you a couple of questions on your, on your uh, thing there, and I'll let you think about those because I'll, I'll let you answer if you wish. But, uh, you know, sometimes we got to kind of coax a mimic or an imitation out of a kid, don't we? Sometimes we want to coach a, I mean, I, I just think of walking. Kids want to walk, you know, and they want to imitate mom and dad, and you got to kind of coax them and their, their instability and this kind of stuff. But maybe there's other things you try to coax a child to do something or whatever. Of course, sometimes they just do it automatically. And, and uh, I, I heard of a father, and I think it was in a daycare setting. He was uh, being reminded how terrible his kid was acting in daycare. And, uh, and then the dad's immediate response was, Oh, no, I don't want him to act like me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, of course, you know, when the kid's... A, but, but interesting, he put those two and two, two and two together. Now, a lot of times it's uh, a lot of times it's just something that that we do even without thinking. We were together; our family was together a couple of years ago. So uh, I think there were four generations or something, and we were all together. And uh, my sister-in-law pointed to a bunch of us that were standing around, and I think it's something like this: that there's a second stance that we kind of. <laughs> And, and yeah, you noticed? Oh my. Well, anyway, yeah. And there was a bunch of us in a circle, and every one of us had kind of had this kind of this, the hip kind of thrown out, the leg kind of thrown out, and we were just kind of, just kind of relaxing there. I noticed I was doing it when I was singing and uh, just caught myself. You know, I don't know. But uh, there, were, there were at least three generations of us standing around telling, probably telling a hunting story or something, you know. And, and, uh, and there it was. There it was. And my sister-in-law said, you got to be kidding. You know, she was just kind of, you know, looking at all of us. And, you know, some of those, some of the things like that, that's kind of inconsequential, except maybe bad posture. But, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of inconsequential. Some things are a lot more serious than that, aren't they? When, when you have the idea of, of mimicking or, or something like that. But uh, one, of the, one of the times that I maybe uh, felt very, I felt very proud. We were in Africa back, you know, a few years ago. And one of the, one of the leaders, just a brilliant man, not because he noticed this, but uh, he was a brilliant man. Uh, and uh, he said... Uh, he said, he complimented me, or he said something to me, he said, after hearing my teaching through the week, he said, you know, now I know where Brooke gets it. You know, and I, I mean, I felt thrilled. I mean, I was thrilled, you know, that, that my daughter was, my daughter uh, emulated, you know, some of my teaching ability or that kind of a thing, you know, that uh, that, that was going on. And uh, just, a, just a little note aside, though, when we think about when we think about emulating or mimicking or, or copying or following someone, uh, let me just encourage you dads, because today uh, we're going to talk about really childlike imitating dad, but we'll get to that. Uh, in 1960, 10% of the children raised that were raised were only had, they were raised without a father, 10% only. But in in uh, more recent times, it's 40%. And if the, if the trend continues with millennials, and a lot of you are millennials, uh, if the trend continues, right now, over half of the births among millennials are to unwed mothers. So over half. So that means the percentage is going to jump here. And uh, 
here's the, here's the reason why. Because their attitude is about half of the millennials that were surveyed believe that a child need, uh, only half believe that a child needs a home with both mother and father present to grow up happily. So only half of the millennials believe that. Now, sometimes things happen and that kind of thing, and, you know, there's things that, that inter, interfere. But, you know, the, they said they, they only need, oh, they may need a father to grow up happily. But the unhappy truth is that fatherless children struggle in a lot of ways. They struggle early with drugs and immorality and are frequently jailed. It makes a difference in very practical rounds. Now, that's not our focus today, but, I, but we need to keep that in mind. And so I, but I think that's just an encouragement to dads. And uh, our focus today is to recognize that God is our Father. That God is our Father. And uh, our verse reads, Dear children... And, and, and then he says, you imitate God. Well, when he's talking about God, if we're children, then he's our father. That's just a given in the context. And so we are the children of God, and that ought to make a difference in our attitude toward God and our attitude toward a lot of things. It's going to impact our lives. So God is our father, and there are implications to that. Let's just reread the verse here if you want to follow along. I'm using New King James. Your, your version might be a slightly different, but it's, the point is there. Therefore, be imitators, and that's a command. Be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, we are just going to focus on verse 1 this morning. But the focus here is be imitators of God. And the idea of imitators or followers, I think the King James uses, this word is, it is where we get our word mimic. You know, that you mimic someone. And it boils down to that. And, and uh, children mimic, mimic. Who do children mimic? Who are some people that children might mimic? Go ahead. Friends. Friends. Teachers. Teachers. Siblings did someone? Say? Yeah, siblings. Who else? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah. <laughs> they, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know you're kind of kidding here when you say Teenage Mutant Ninja. Yeah. They, but they mimic heroes that they see, whether they're comics or real or unreal or what. They mimic heroes. Who are some heroes that children have? Okay, policemen, firemen. They, oh yeah, when I grow up, I want to be. Okay, well, I heard some other. Athletes. Athletes. Oh, big. That's huge, isn't it? Yeah, I'm going to be a pro quarterback or whatever it is. Uh, what else? Yep, yeah, movie stars, TV stars. You know, and some of those we'd say, yeah, anyway, anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah, very good. And uh, um, I, I forgot to ask you, what are some things that you imitated can you can anybody tell something that you imitated from your family what did you pick up from your family that you imitate or do you want to say <laughs> uh oh my, my father was what's referred to as slew foot and when he would walk his right foot would turn out and i always tried to mimic that whenever i would follow him downtown interesting I would try to walk behind him and turn my foot out but it wasn't natural Right, so dad had a dad had a problem with walking, and he he put his foot out, and so you tried to cop. Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. Know if he's even aware of it. Yeah. Well, I tried to copy that, and I never could. It wasn't never good. could. It never really worked yeah, for you because dad had a problem with. Yeah. Natural. I had to force myself. To yeah. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? If you dad's walking. You want to follow his walk. Yeah, and you know, I mean, that's an intentional thing. Uh, how about anyone else? Anyone else want to share just a going to church? Going to church. Aha. Uh -huh. What a good habit to what a good habit or good thing to mimic. Yes. Yeah. All right. All right. I know. We could probably go on and on and you probably get thinking and, and whatever, but but yeah, we think about those kind of things. However, however, when we come to when we come to mimicking people, you know, let's just pick the hero. The hero type idea, what, like some movie star or something like that. 
Uh, any, uh, any of you ever want to be the Lone Ranger? Anybody? Yeah, me, yeah. The Lone Ranger. Or Superman. Now, I heard some kids, some kids tried to jump off something and the cape didn't hold them, right? I mean, but most don't imitate everything, do they? Most don't imitate every single little thing. And you know, when we, but, but they do. I mean, what are some things they pick up from movie stars? Hairstyles, language, uh, other, you know, other kind of hairstyles or the look, the clothes, the, yeah, the image. They try to pick up that kind of thing. But they, they, they get some things and some of those are good and some of those are bad. And, uh, but when we come to, when our verse says imitate or mimic God, can we imitate everything about God? No, we can't, can we? You know, there's some things that are reserved for God alone. And if we have a proper view of God, if our view of God is proper, we, I mean, God is way up there. God is, God is so awesome. And God is, and you can start listing some of those traits. We can't, we can't mimic everything about God. So what is our context talking about? Well, when I look at the first word in my translation, it says, therefore. You know what therefore does? It links us to the context. Back up with me to the previous verse. Look at the previous verse, 432. It says, and be kind. Interesting, here's a command too. Same kind of command we have in, in verse uh, one here, it, where it says, be imitators. The word be is a command. The word be in verse 32 is a command. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, one another even as God, as God, just like God. That's the point he's making. Therefore, therefore, be imitators. Be like God, at least in some of these character qualities like kindness, like love, like and well, look at verse two, and walk in love. The and in verse two tells us love is part of this idea. Now, I'm not, I don't think he's saying this to limit it, limit it to forgiveness and love. I don't think he's trying to limit that at all. But both of these ideas, both of these ideas give us an idea of what, it, what he's saying here. Be like God, imitate God, copy God. When he's saying that, it, it gives us the sense that there's, that it's, uh, it's not things like, you know, it's not things like Genesis 1. Do you ever think of that? Genesis 1.1 gives us two things that you can't copy about God. You ever think of that? Number one, God is eternal. You can't copy that. Yes, if you believe the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid the penalty for your sins, you have eternal life. You are an eternal being. But you, you were not there in the beginning. You, you can't go back. God is absolutely eternal. We can have eternal life. Life comes from God. And then creation. You can say, well, I'm an artist. I create a masterpiece. Or I'm a builder and I can build, you know, whatever it is. You can create certain things, but there's not a one of us here who began with just ourselves and nothing to work with and, say, and spoke and it was instantly there. When we say God is the creator, I mean, we're talking about God, God something from nothing except himself. And so there's two things. Right in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God was there and he created out of nothing the heavens and the earth. And uh, so we can't imitate everything about God. He's talking about these characteristics, these kinds of things like, like we've seen in verse 32, like forgiveness, like love. It's characteristics. It's, it's things that, that uh, are not exclusively God-type business. So we're looking for those kind of things that would imitate God, the kindness and compassion and things that we saw. Uh, when, I, when I look back at verse 32, uh, just recently, being I brought up my daughter Brooke in Africa already, just recently in Africa, Brooke's cook, that's a little rhyme to that, isn't there? But uh, her cook, whom she's really close to, and some of you saw this on Facebook or whatever, but uh, her cook took in her ex-husband, 
a mean old drunken cuss. She took him into her home as he was dying of AIDS. And she, she showed the kindness and compassion like God. And he recently died. And uh, anyway, you could look at her blog or whatever. But he recently died. But the people that came to mourn were really there in support of, of the cook. More so than the mean old cuss of, a, of an ex-husband that she had. And people were there and honoring her for her godlike compassion to somebody who had wronged her, to somebody who, you know, who really was mean and whatever. That's a godlike, and the whole village knew it and honored her. You know, when we think about when we think about uh, someone that has this kind of these godlike characteristics, you know, even in the human form, we've got to realize they're still human. Are they perfect? No. The, we need to realize that the standard for imitating God is God. The standard is God. It's not what someone else actually does. And so to really imitate him, we really need his power working in us. And God has given us the Holy Spirit to enable us to be able to be that to, and have those God-like characteristics. And it just emphasizes how we need, a, we need a, that relationship. We need that connection to God on a daily, moment-by-moment -moment basis to be able to be what God would have us to be, to be able to really obey this verse, to be an imitator of God. And so let's, let's move on to the idea of the Father here. Uh, point number two in your outline. Now, your verse just says God, but of course, <clears throat> of course, when he emphasizes we are his children, then... Uh, that we as children are imitating. I mean, he's talking about God the Father. God the Father. And, and this idea of us being his children, I, I, hope you just, I hope that just sticks with you today. We're God's kids. We're God's children. I hope that that just kind of, if you, if you walk away with nothing, I hope that just kind of rattles around a little bit there and that you can just hang on to that idea that as God's children... That's supposed to somehow, that's supposed to make a difference in our lives. It's supposed to have an impact on us. And I, and I hope we'll bring out some truths here in a moment. But so as we think about God, though, and this, this idea of God being the Father, um, you know, it's, it's very evident that God is the Father throughout the New Testament especially. Uh, it's there in the Old Testament, but every book in the New Testament uh, has this this God the Father type idea brought out, uh, maybe with the exception of 3 John. I, I think it might even be there in 3 John, but, but you know, short little book. It mentions God a couple, three times, and, and I, I think if you read between the lines, maybe you can even sense the idea of a, of a relationship type there. But uh, every, other, every other book has the, has the idea of the God being the Father type idea. Uh, I think it dominates. In the Old Testament, what you have is that Israel, Israel was the son of God. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 22. And so in the, in the Old Testament, you have the idea of the national relationship. In the New Testament, you have that personal relationship. The personal relationship. There's a, I think there's a little difference there. And as you look at the the relationship in the Gospels. What's kind of cool is, is to see, and I'd like you to turn to John 17, if you would, please. I want you to see the relationship that there was between the Father and the Son, meaning Jesus and the Father. I want you to see that idea in John chapter 17. We're not going to read a whole bunch of this, but um, I went through six times in this chapter you see Jesus praying to the Father. And you see this real connection. And over and over you have pronouns, you and your, and that kind of thing. I, I just love this, this chapter. Notice how he begins in verse, uh, in verse 1, you know, Jesus praying. He says, Father, the hour has come. You know what hour this is? This is the prayer in Gethsemane. This is the prayer that 
that uh, where he is sweating great drops of blood, according to Luke. This is the prayer where he prays, Father, take this cup from me if it's possible, but your will be done. Uh, and this is part of that. Now, John doesn't bring that up in this context. But you can see the intimate relationship with the Father. And I hope that you, as we, as we look at this, I hope you can see that we too can have a relationship with the Father. We're His children. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may be glorified in you. Just that attitude of humility. As you have given authority over all flesh. Now some of this doesn't apply. We can't apply this directly to us. But we can apply the relationship. The relationship that's there. Uh, skip down to verse 5. And now, O oh Father. I mean, can you feel it there? Now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself. With the glory which I had with you before the world was. Boy, there's a lot of theology in that. But just that sense of relationship. Let me skip down to another. I circled them all in my, in my Bible. Uh, uh, I'll start in verse 11. Now I am no longer in the world, but they, these are in the world. He's praying for his disciples. And I, and I come to you, O Holy Father. Notice what he's doing, just exalting the Father, just recognizing his holiness and holiness and exclusivity. Keep through your name those whom you have given me. And, you know, just that sense of security. Skip down, I think the next one is 21. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me. He's praying for a oneness, a oneness, a relationship. That's what he's talking about when he talks about those who are with him. 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Oh, righteous Father. Can you picture this? Can you picture this? Or are you like the disciples that were over there a, a few yards away sawing logs? You know, they're, they're over there, can't keep their eyes open, they're sleepy and they're drowsy, and, and Jesus is sweating great drops of blood and just pouring his heart out. Oh, righteous Father. Anyway, I, I think you just get the sense here. Look at, look at 26. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it that, that the love which you loved me may be in them and I, and I in them. Do you have the Holy Spirit residing in you? Yes. The scripture tells you you do. It's the Spirit of Christ. It's that, it's that similar idea. Sure, it's a little different there, but it's a similar idea. It's a relational thing. That's what, he's, that's what he's crying out for. And, and I, I just, I, I hope you're moved by that. That this is, this is the relationship that's possible. This is the relationship that po that's possible as a child of the Father. You can have a relationship with him. When we come to Paul's epistles, it's just, there's that frequent relationship mentioned between between the Father and us as His children. That's frequently used in, in the New Testament, in Paul's epistles, that uh, we humans are His children. Why can't it be? Why can't it be like that? And I know oftentimes when, when, it, when the Father is talked about, oftentimes when the Father is talked about, someone comes up with the idea and they say, yeah, but my father was a, a drunk, an absent, or what, you know, whatever it is. My father wasn't a good father. You know what? That doesn't matter. Because we should get our relationship, we should understand our relationship to the father based on the word of God. It's only understood in the word of God. It doesn't matter where the human father failed. All humans' fathers fail. That doesn't matter, and that's not where our eyes are to be. Our eyes are to be on the Word of God, on God the Father, 
And the reality that we have in him needs to be taken by faith. It's what God says. It's not what we imagine. It's not what we experience on the human realm. It's the relationship that the scriptures talk about. And when we think about the father relationship, it's evident that our father, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 said, Blessed be God, the God and father, notice how he brings it up, of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. We have a relationship with God we, and, and we, can, we can be encouraged by what God says. And we can honor the Father and we can be blessed. Those blessings that God has given us, every one of those spiritual blessings are blessings that are absolute and eternal and everything in between. We have a relationship with the, with the Father. And as you go through Ephesians chapter 1, he guarantees spiritual blessings such as being chosen, predestined, adopted, uh, redeemed, forgiven, and sealed with the Holy Spirit to guarantee it all. Those things are all ours in Christ. But let me pick on one of those. In verse 5 of Ephesians chapter 1, it says, we've been adopted. And the idea of adoption literally means to place as a son. Son placed. In other words, every one of us has the spiritual blessing of being a son, being a legitimate heir and child of God. That's what God says that we are in Him, in Christ. We have a father-son relationship. We have a father-child relationship that God says is ours. And that is that is sure and secure. We've been placed as a son in God's family with all the rights and privileges. And it just, it just emphasizes our relationship that we are his family. Point number three. We're his family. The word for children that's used here is the common word for child of son or daughter. So even though adoption uses the word son in it, don't get, ladies, you're not left out. This word children includes daughters and sons, and it emphasizes our legitimacy as his children. You know, yeah, I've already mentioned, human failures mar our idea and our picture of, of uh, the father-child relationship, but that need not. That shouldn't dictate what kind of a relationship we have with the father. It shouldn't dictate that. It should be based on the Word of God. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that, a lot of lists, and I give you, I've given you a couple on the, on the screen here. There's a lot of lists out there from, uh, I, I think some of them are three up to 101 different things that a child needs to hear from his dad or his parent. Some of those say parent, some of those say dad. But I think the importance of dad is coming out here. And, uh, you know, as I, as I was thinking about this, I thought back a dozen years ago when my parents were celebrating their 50th anniversary. We were, uh, we were in a small room, and, you know, I don't know how many, how many of us descendants were there. Uh, I mean, all of us descendants of my parents were there, and then a few, a few close friends and that kind of thing as well. But dad shared a spiritual, he, spirit, he shared a blessing for each of us, his kids. And he, he emphasized three things. I can't remember the third one without having to dig up some, a video or some notes or whatever. But I remember two of them clearly. Number one, parents need to hear from their dad, I love you. And number two, I'm proud of you. And I think the other one, the other one I think kind of fits is, I think this is it, but I'm not 100% sure that dad mentioned this, but it's, it's kind of on these lists. I'm in your corner. I'm on your side. I'm there for you. Those are, and those kind of things, you, you'll notice, I love you, I'm proud of you. And then different ones go different ways there. Some of these might have copied other ones, but I love you and I'm proud of you. And uh, it's interesting how statistics bear out that a father's influence impacts the physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being of a child. Now, that doesn't mean God can't interrupt and intervene, that kind of thing. But it, it impacts those three areas. In other words, our whole being. 
And a lot of times, you know, a father's just a father's mere presence in the home has an effect on a child's academic and economic and psychological well-being. It's just those are just givens. Why wouldn't it be the same with a relationship with the father? Why wouldn't it be the same? When we realize, wow, I'm a child of God. I'm a children of the Father. Why wouldn't it make a difference in our lives? Why wouldn't it impact several things? And I've just chosen seven. I've chosen seven I'm going to share with you about thing, the way that our relationship with the Father should impact our lives. Number one, identity. You know, I mentioned that as, as we begin this message. If you go away with nothing today, you can go away with, I'm God's kid. I'm God's kid. I'm God's child. Man, that ought to make a difference in your life. Just knowing that truth. God is my father. And the reality of that, the identity that we are God's children. Number two, right hand in glove is security. Hand in glove ought to be security. You're a child of God, and God doesn't ditch his kids. God is there. I mean, he's the perfect father. If sonship, in Ephesians 1.5, that adoption idea... It's absolute, irrevocable, unchangeable, eternally ours in Christ. If that's true, if that's true, wow, we have a Father who, is, who ought to give us this sense of security and just the impact that's going to be on us. But he gives us a sense of security. God promised Israel in, in Hebrews 3.13.5, that he would never leave them or forsake them. Throughout Paul's epistles, we have that assurance over and over and over again. If you have believed the gospel, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. But over and over and over, we have that type of emphasis. We had it in chapter 4 and verse 30. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed till the day of redemption. That assurance that we have, that security that's ours. We ought to live in that sense of security. We ought to embrace that. We ought to sense that, and it ought to make a difference in how we do everything. You know what religion offers? All religion can say, well, you, you be good enough, and maybe, no. The gospel, uh, gospel of grace is that we've been saved, and we are secure in him, and that we can stand in him. We serve out of love and gratitude, not to try to get something from God. And so as we, that sense of security, there's also, number three, that security should impact our desire and our motivation to please him. Desire and motivation both. I think I only put one on the board, but desire and motivation. Is, it's, it impacts us because we, we're secure in him. Man, I want to I wanna be like dad. I want to be that way. It gives us direction. There's direction for pleasing him. Not to get, but because we have. What assurance that we have. Uh, it gives us an eternal perspective of glory. You see that in John chapter 17 as Jesus was, as Jesus was praying to the Father. There was that eternal perspective. There was glory associated with it. Why not us the same way? We're joint heirs with him. Romans chapter 8. We're not going to turn there, but Romans 8 is just loaded. You ever get down? Read Romans chapter 8. Starting out with no condemnation and ending in verses 38 and 39. That nothing can separate us from the love of God. Absolutely nothing. Wow. And that whole chapter there. And also in that chapter... Maybe I got stuck there a little bit, but the sufferings. In other words, everything in life has a purpose. Verse 18 and verse 28. Everything in life for the believer has eternal purpose written all over it. And that will give us purpose in living. 
You know, nothing this life ever dishes out can ever separate us from the love of God because we're his children. We're his. What an assurance. What a, that's just seven. And that's, I think we could go on and on and on with what we have in Christ and the benefits and ways that this could have, but we're God's. We belong to him. We're, he's our father. And so when our verse says, says to imitate him and we start thinking about who God is and we think about our relationship, you know what? He loves us. He's proud of us as we allow the spirit to work in us. He's in our corner all the time. There's not a time he's not there. And if that's not enough, look at the adjective, point B on your outline, we're his dear children. We're not just plain old kids. We're his dear. We're his beloved. I, th I, think, of, I think of Jacob. Yeah, Jacob wasn't the best father in the sense that he loved Joseph more than he loved the other ten. He loved, he, you know, but that's what you get when you get too many wives in the mix. But anyway. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, he, he loved Joseph. He had, but, but think of that idea of that favored that favored idea, you're a Joseph to God. You're the favored one. You're the beloved one. And the, and the Greek word here for dear is that sense of beloved. You know, you've heard of agape, agape love in 1 Corinthians. Well, this is agape tos. That's the, the noun that's used here. You're a dear, you're a beloved. It's, it goes back to the root of the perfect love of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that perfect, absolute, kind, and unfailing love. That's what he's talking about. And you're, you're there. You're in his embrace. You're his beloved child. God loved us, and he continues to love us with in, inseparable love. Love that can't be destroyed, can't be messed with. No wonder he calls us his beloved children. Yeah, as you leave today, I'm God's kid. I'm God's beloved kid. I'm, his, I'm the one that he loves like nothing else. And so as a beloved child, the command is here, be imitators. Be childlike imitators of God. You know, sometimes we earthly fathers might get embarrassed if our kid does certain things, right? You know, to mimic us. But mimicking your heavenly father will never ever embarrass him because the only way you can imitate him properly is to allow the spirit to work in you. It's going to be a perfect imitation. You'll never embarrass him as you mimic him. It'll only honor him. It'll only give him glory. And then the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about different aspects of a, a life that mimics God in very practical ways. But don't forget the bottom line. Be imitators as his beloved children. What an honor we have. What a position we have. Father, we praise you. We thank you for the challenge that we have in just these simple words. And we know we need your enabling power to accomplish these things. We commit ourselves to you now, Christ's wonderful name. Amen.